Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy uh, that I can welcome you at the second day of the World uh, Organizations for Systems and Cybernetics Congress, uh, organized together with the Russian Academy of Sciences. Today, today we'll have an interesting set of um, events. We'll start with keynotes, then we'll go to sections. Welcome, and warm greetings to the friend of WOSC who can see me in recording right now. I also hope to be able to see them in attendance soon. Congratulations on this further event, which, as usual, celebrates the growth of knowledge and studies in the field of cybernetics and systems. Today, I'm going to talk about the evolution from Homo sapiens sapiens to Homo digitalis, and more especially, my talk as the cultural paradigm has its central conceptual element. Many of you know that Thomas Kuhn understood the paradigm as referring only to the exact sciences. But, as often happens, and perhaps the most important thing is that the concepts, and especially the memes, is qualifying, are then reported on other types of cultural contexts. Well, the cultural paradigm is something different from the scientific paradigm. Therefore, and it does not strictly concern what are modifications within a particular science theory. You will remember that the classical examples also reported by Kuhn are the paradigm shift. Think about the passage to Ptolemaic theory from to Copernican theory, rather than from Newtonian physics to Albert Einstein physics, or even to the later studies of Heisenberg and other of quantum mechanics, the cultural paradigm is something different, is a, a something that essentially concerns a change of perspective in what everyday life is. The question is, how is possible to imagine the parallel between cultural paradigm and scientific paradigm? Let's imagine it with a metaphor of this statue, probably referring to the Bronze Age, in which we have the opportunity to look at it from different angles not only, but through the filter of a transparent panel. It's clear that on that panel, due to the perspective and the angle of the panel, we will see different images that are all attributable to the statuette, and probably for this reason, all exact. All actually vision of reality, but which become instead substantially a transformation of the same, so much so that observers position it in different perspectives. For example, an observer in perspective 4 compared to an observer in perspective 2 could have a completely different image of the same reality. But importantly, if in a scientific paradigm what is crucial is practically the impossibility of explaining previous problem with the old theory and therefore needing a new one to explain them. What is the equivalent in cultural paradigm? paradigm? What happens when a cultural parallelism must necessarily change? Well, in the change of a cultural paradigm, what happens is that human beings, regardless of their activities, their position, their knowledge, their level of education, realize that something has changed in the daily procedures of managing own activities. This means that there has been a change in terms of time and space, compared to the possibilities that the same one had before. With an example, I can make it better if in the scientific paradigm it's difficult to say what is the actual change brought about, for example, by the invention of the bulb, rather than laser light, and if even in the context of those are the technological technicians, we cannot deny that, for example, the laser was a fundamental and portentous invention for all applied medical sciences. 
For all that is surgery, the laser today is probably fundamental in a series of surgical applications. But what happened instead for the light bulb? And which of the two discoveries, from the point of view of the cultural paradigm, has a more significant impact? Well, imagine that the light bulb has substantially transformed even for the common man what was the duration of the day. That means we said that it thanks to, the inv to this invention, which was then carried over on the practice of everyday social life. We had the certainty that our day lasted longer. No longer just the solar time, therefore from sunrise to sunset but the possibility of continuing our activities. Today you know that most of the activities are carried out continuously both of an industry and service activities. Thanks to the transformed light energy that is visible light and which allows us to continue as we still had the light of the day. So it's clear that the type of dimension transfused in the social because that modify the process in their intimate constitution much more than others. And here is that the cultural paradigm have a variation when this process are strongly impacted. Another example could be by energy. Imagine what happens when we had the possibility of being able to build the railways, the first steam trains, or the first steamboats. From the point of view of spatiality and temporality achievements, journey that are were previously impossible are made possible. So families who detached themselves with relatives who drifted away, immigrating and living, and who could perhaps only be revised at the end of their earthly existence, become reachable in state. So the overall process varied, the movement of goods varied and so on. In short, cultural transformation are essentially linked to the modification of what the essential process of both the scientist and common man from the point of view of the use of time and space. Consequently, with this latest scientific transformation linked to the so-called digital world, time and space are even summarized in a single qualification, information. Time and space, for the first time, are completely eradicated from what was their previous conception and from what was their meaning also for the common man. And that is state broke back in the modality that blurs the conception of time and space, which it brings back more to the image of dream, in which we find ourselves flying and moving and then realizing that we are only done in mentally, only in mentally. The image that you see in the slide is the one relating to the man wearing augmented reality goggles, through which he can have a sensation of reality from the point of view of almost, of almost total perceptions. Today we have the difficulty of some sensory organs that are not being completely adapted to the digital transformation. But this is a probably in progress. It will happen soon. When everything is done, and therefore when our sense organs are brought back to the possibility of digital representation, time and space will coincide with the information. All of this is already happening, and it's important to try to analyze what impact the cultural, cultural paradigm shift is having on us as a human beings. A first evidence is given by ubiquity and dissociation. Apparently terms that can be considered synonyms, but they have a completely different impact on our existences. Ubiquity is an enhancement of our existential capacity. Previously it was referred only to the sacred scriptures or fideistic scriptures. Therefore, they were uh, saints and divinities who could have the gift of ubiquity. Today, undoubtedly, the gift of ubiquity is also allowed to human beings. Let me explain. Think about you are listening to me in this moment and perhaps having a conversation in streaming at the same time 
and I am even at my house, and therefore I live with a family reality. Ubiquity is realized. On the other hand, what is the encountered part, the other side of the coin? The other side of the coin is the so-called systemic dissociation. Essentially, the fact that for the first time we all experience multiple personalities and due to multiple personalities as described, for example, by the writer Fernando Pessoa, who himself said and was afflicted from multiple personalities. We find ourselves being dissociated. That means we find ourselves no longer having a specific identity that we decline every day with the different context that we live but we find ourselves having identification profiles which are perhaps also significant different. There are many people who live different profiles with different social networks and this progressively leads them to have a significant impact on their psyche. That is to actually have a feeling of dissociation, a difficulty in identifying the common denominator through the different profiles that lie live daily. So, we end up having a real identity that is transformed into many identity masks. The Sergio Barile, known by the work environment, could be completely different from the Sergio Barile known by his family, rather than by the Italian academic environment, rather than by the world of friends, or still deriving also from the occasional context that Sergio Barile can experience through his digital representations. All these will become more and more significant and massive within the existence of all of us. Then it's clear that the relationship with digital in the moment in which the area of profiling in which we identify ourselves will grow will require intense, continuous support. A sort of a return to the past. We can see the images that refer to the court of Europe, let's say about the Renaissance development, in which there were the so-called EIO, who were assistant guardians, who entered the noble families, powerful and economically gifted families, who assisted the, the young giants in their formation, in all those who were the knowledge, humanistic or scientific, and this support proceeded over time, a logic that also leads back to more remote times. Just think about of what was the relationship between Seneca and Nero, where Seneca was the cultural assistant, the Ayo, of Nero. Even if it ended, as well we know, tragically. And why it ended tragically? This is probably a reflection to make because the interference of what was the influence of the Ayo had become excessive. The concern, the story of Nero and Seneca. Today we have a substitute for the Ayo that are digital assistants. Cortana is an example of these assistants who firstly and progressively enter the essential process and dynamic of each of us. It does no matter, I repeat, what is the level of social commitment or what is the status that the individual has reached in his existence. These assistants adapt, enter and immediately rise to the same level as those they have supporting. Now it's clear that the progressive shift generated by this logic is necessarily destabilizing all that was the creed and the certainties that we had. There is a shift of the various religions that many define toward scientism. In fact, the shift towards something more singular, if you want even more worrying, exists and it's towards and it's called dataism. In other words, it's not so much science itself that gives us confidence. Indeed, perhaps, 
the latest representation of the relationship with the science in the field of epidemiology and the distrust that all the world have had for vaccines makes us understand that there is no fideistic relation with science. What is fideistic is with data. It's no coincidence that even in the evidence of the COVID evidence, people are divided into those who believe in some data, which may even be false. We have verified this. And those who believe in other data. However, certainly, the faith groups have divided on the belief that some statements are true and proven and therefore some data greater than others. We are progressively sliding towards a religion of data. And it's clear then that we will need to upgrade our mind, so just like machines in the past. I used the term caterpillar precisely to try to immediately render the equivalence between what big bulldozers did in past, the largest moving machines that strengthened the muscle of man. We are now empowering the mind through search engine and various social networks and all the apps that can somehow help us in daily process. In my opinion, what is happening is tragic, in the sense that we progressively, without realizing it, are passing from what is a society engaged in creating new knowledge for a solving problem to a society engaged in searching among ready-made solutions. I have to use a society of cognitions to society of recognitions. Let me better explain. While before, also through the positivist approach, we needed to know the problem well in order to formulate the hypothesis and then be able to somehow develop a solution. And this was not only the work of the scientist, but was the work also of the common man who faced his daily life and realized that he had the difficulty to try to solve Certainly for the common man very often solving, it meant calling the expert. That is, it meant calling the one of the had core knowledge of the situation and solution. The question is, what's happening in the digital reality? A shift is happening toward the ability to find who has the solution rather than brainstorming, framing the problem and imagining innovative hypotheses for a solution in a spreading anywhere. Also, I will say, in what they are, we could define them, the lower rank of scientific knowledge. That means today we are much more oriented to being, to being able to reorganize, systematize knowledge based not so much on a correct selection, knowledge of the problem, but rather on the ability to be able to find what are the existing solution hypotheses of the web. Basically, we are leading to a shift that from knowledge direct as uh, to recognition, that means uh, we do not need to understand how to solve it. We need to find where it has been already solved. Probably you will say that this is a, means little. No, it means a lot. It means that the progressive affirmation of human quality will be addressed not so much to those who know how to think and solve, as to those who know how to find solutions within a jumble of existing solutions, and attempt at search engine that could lead to such strong recognitions. As to qualify as lack of knowledge is, for example, Wolfram Alpha. Stephen Wolfram's initial attempt was to create a search engine that could even replace itself in the elaboration of the development of resolutive hypotheses, but which then ended up ending a more powerful engine than others, because it uses associative techniques to recover data and generate recognitions that is, knowledge of things that already exist and that are useful for a solution, because they can be used so much by the common man 
in his needs and by the high qualified level scientist. I think that the liberty of now distinguishing between levels of science, which someone intends to, pr to improve a systematic knowledge, and we have the distinctions, is becoming very evident in, in some disciplines, and in particular in managerial disciplines. We have articles published in ranking journals in which substantially there are tautologies between what its research hypothesis and the solution found are not ever more frequent. This is precisely because the exercise essentially connect, concerned recognitions and not cognition. It's clear that you can imagine how the power of platform has become more and more significant. There is no day now in which any human beings who has digital technology does not turn to it and does not try to solve their problems with it. Should we tomorrow feel the lack of digitation, which is today present in our process? Our civilization would have an incredible, unheard of repercussion never imagined in the past. The power of platforms is now significant and unavoidable in the daily process of our everyone's existence. A further reflection that derives from the power of platform is what I have called the tyranny of the algorithm. The tyranny is linked to a concept already known to us that of as requisite variety, that is essentially that of the variety imposed in the relationship of both dialogue and context interaction bit, uh, between different entities, the question is, what happens today through the algorithm implemented in the apps of the platform? It happens that they determine what is possible variety in relative to the communication. As an example of this, imagine those of you are physically present at the Congress and what they have to deal with in order to be there. They connected to platform that organize the travel, define what were the means allowing them to move from one part of the globe to another. They had to always establish price and reservation with the platform while using their platform connected to financial system. Therefore, with the platform that connect them to their bank, they had to organize the payments, but at the same time, with the platform that connected them to the management of organizations of the conference, they had to synchronize everything. Well, in the past, all of this has an enormous degree of freedom because it derives from interlocution between individuals. A more or less long phone call, more or less repeated clarifications. Today, the variety of platform does not allow it. You have the list of a series of possible choices that can be dichotomous, multiple, and once you made, made the choice. In the end, you have an outcome in which the platform virtually tells you it goes good and or no good. And if no good, you have no other option. If you are given this possibility by the platform, you can reiterate your process, but you cannot speak. So the variety you adapt to is the variety of the platform, and progressively, this variety of the platform see the evocative term, platform, that is in substance, we will all be flattened on what is a modality that will not allow any creativity, therefore, most of the process will be absorbed by a flat modality, common to all and probably for this reason lacking what is the further sense that we normally attribute to the intellect. By the means, we will have a context populated not by humans, but by posthumans and transhumans, where the concept of posthumans and transhumans is significantly different. As a posthuman, we can imagine a human who is endowed with an expanded intelligence due to technology. 
transhuman uh, where practically there is a technology that is taken on dimensions itself uh, of a sentient entity within the context. So we will have a society in which posthuman and transhuman elements can collaborate with each other at various levels and in various capacities. All this will seem to point to an inevitable catastrophe. Well, I conclude with, let's say, a scene of optimism linked to this Latin phrase, Ubi lux lucet, humanitas surgit. The lux is more energy than light, so where there is an energy, then humanity has the backbone. It has the possibility of imagining its new renaissance in new prerogative of development of evolution within the context. From my viewpoint, the South after dimension, the South after revolutionary path, cannot but transcend what is the classic concept of materiality to which we are accustomed, recovering probably from that is the development of the scientist paradigm. That part of knowledge not yet impacting within the cultural paradigm concerning quantum physics, that is practically the representation of the reality imaginated as a space of probability. Therefore, I specify that the conclusive considerations, unlike the previous ones that have an ambition of objectivity, are strongly subjective. Presupposes a return to spirituality, a need to imagine something concerning the development of an intelligent consciousness wider than which can be traced back to earthly profiles and identities. This can only be understood with an hope. The representation which, uh, with which I wanted to conclude is that the encounter between humanity and divinity of Michelangelo Sistine Chapel, and therefore I transformed the man already into posthuman and transhuman, imagining that artificial intelligence and the augmented intelligence can allow him to bring his finger closer to the finger of the divine, the finger of the supernatural. All this, I repeat, is highly questionable. It's a certainly a personal conclusion. I would like to thank you for the attention and I renew my hope to be able to meet you soon. Many thanks and see you soon.